Hey guys, welcome back to a beginner's series on restoring very early tube-based black and white televisions. When we last left off, we talked about some safety concerns and some tools. Now we're going to dig into the chassis. We have our service info. We have our chassis up on the workbench. I'm going to go through the schematic at a higher level, block by block, and identify those areas on the chassis. While doing so, we're going to be examining the chassis. We haven't looked underneath the power supply yet. I want to look for any trouble signs, and I'll talk about what those signs are as we go through it. Well, let's start out with the power supply. We had noticed that one of the tubes is not right. It should be a 5Y3 GT, and they have a 5U4 in there. will work okay, but it puts a bit of a strain on the transformer. What we haven't done though is looked underneath it because it comes on this board which is great because it protects it from the environment. So this is very likely going to be pristine underneath. Now to get this off, I'm guesstimating those are 5 sixteenths. So 5 sixteenths nut driver out. What we're doing is I'm also going to clean it up a bit. A little shop vac is a nice thing to have. Mostly we've got some old cobwebs and uh, some debris from trees of all things. There's a number of maple tree propellers in here, spinners, whatever you want to call them. I'm not sure how they got in here. I'm going to guess it was stored in a garage for a while. These are all fairly loose, but not super loose. Probably has been opened up at some point since it was made. Also possible the wood has shrunk a little bit. It's in the winter now and the air is a lot drier, so the wood is going to shrink a little. Um, why do I care? Well, ideally you want this to be uh, never touched since it was made. <laughs> it's a little un, uh, unusual though, given how old these are and that they were likely often serviced in the past. But this does have all the original screws and each screw has two washers on them. That's unusual if this has been serviced because it's so easy to lose track of them. And of course, as we're taking this stuff out, we're going to put all of our nuts and bolts and washers and screws in a container so we don't lose them. Pocket knife is also a handy thing to keep on the workbench. Let's see if we can pry this off. I don't know why that is so... There we go. Well, <laughs> it really tightened that one down. It just sunk into the wood. Alright, are you ready? Here we go. Voila. Yeah, I would say that was 100% original. Why do I say that? Well, let's take a closer look. As always, I just took a bunch of reference photos from various angles in case I need to refer back to it. Why do I say it's all original? I don't see any obvious evidence that anything's been cut, replaced, spliced. But also, from having seen a lot of vintage electronics, I know these are the old parts. We have one paper cap that's been dipped in beeswax. That's how these were made as a cardboard tube. Inside of it is a paper foil roll, a lead coming out of either end, and it's dipped in wax. That's the main thing we want to replace to get this set working reliably. And around it we see these black shiny plastic things. It's just paper caps inside of a plastic tube. They thought by sealing them from the environment, in some cases injecting some oil inside, would keep moisture out, keep them from deteriorating. Because that is the failure mode in these, is that it's organic, it's paper, it's wax, they deteriorate. Time, moisture, insects, rodents. Unfortunately, that didn't really turn out to be the case. In fact, it actually accelerated a little bit. From what I've heard, from what I've read, from studies that were done decades ago, they determined that the, the problem wasn't so much moisture as it was residual acid in the paper that they used that would gradually deteriorate the paper regardless of what the environment situation is. So these all have to be replaced. 
We can test them as we take them out. I can guarantee you they're all going to be bad. And this is another type. Looks like a beige plastic tube. It has a paper cap inside of it. It's just another style. This looks very similar to that, but it's a little bit dull brown. That's a power resistor. Carbon composition to be specific. Resistors can be made in a variety of ways. One type is to have resistance wire that's coiled up. You use an appropriate length to get the resistance you want. Another way to do it is with carbon. Carbon is what they call a semiconductor. It sort of lets some uh, current go through, so it's not, it's not an insulator, but it's also not a good conductor like metal. It's in between. So by packing a certain amount of carbon in between two metal electrodes, you can get a certain resistance. Unfortunately, just like the paper caps, the carbon idea didn't turn out to be so hot. Over, over time, again, moisture deterioration, the value on those can change. Also just from use, a lot of years of heat and, uh, and stresses to them can cause them to deteriorate. Often they drift up in value, but they can go down low in value. We should check all of them. Don't assume that anything is still good. Now, the only thing that jumps out of me right away is this gooey mess. This is probably beeswax that's leaked out of this transformer. If we look at that board I just removed, it's probably, uh, <laughs> you can see where <laughs> the board was below that because it pooled onto that a little bit. That is not really a concern. You might think the transformer shot and its guts have oozed out. Not really. Again, I've, I've worked on a bunch of these. I've seen this in every one of them. Inside of these metal boxes, we're going to have an iron core, laminated pieces of metal, E-shaped, that are stacked up, and there are coils of wire around them. There'll be some E-shaped e pieces and some I-shaped pieces. And in the voids where the letter E would be, you have wire going around. They want to insulate it. They want to pack this with material. The wire is enameled. They would pour molten wax into it. After all the windings were done, they had the leads coming out to completely seal the thing. Beeswax is a fairly low melting temperature, so it's not unusual to see this after many years of being used and getting warm that it's oozed out. Sometimes it'll be black because they put some type of tar, petroleum-based thing, a substance in there, and that oozes out in the same way. Notice this one has not. Smaller transformer, probably didn't get as hot, but also might just have not have wax inside of it. So it's not great to have this pool out, but I'm not concerned about it. Also, as these parts age, as these capacitors get what we call leaky, meaning the insulation, the paper inside them isn't doing its job, they start conducting more current. Same thing happens to these parts on the other side, and even more so, these guys. So what can happen is the second still be working okay, but these are conducting a little more internal leakage current than they should be, and they're going to start getting warm, which puts more of a strain on the transformers, which causes them to get warmer than usual, which can cause that wax to start pooling out as well. So, no, nothing concerns me about this. It's, this is what you want to see. It's dirty. Doesn't matter. A little bit of wax pulled out. Doesn't matter. It's all original parts. That's what we want to see. That means nobody's messed with it. Nobody's tinkered with it. We don't have to do any detective work to figure out what's going on. It's as it should be. Now let's look at the service info for that lower chassis. Let's start out with the tube chart. This shows what, what tubes go into uh, each of the sockets, and they have outlines for the other parts. Our two power transformers, this is a filter choke, audio output transformer, two electrolytic caps. Most of the schematic is the upper chassis. The lower chassis is the strip along the right, and then up into the top. The demarcation being this heavier black line. There's a little diagram here, some rectangles and 
some designators. That is the plug that connects the upper to the lower chassis. Let's start out down here. All these points on the left, that's the plug. To the right of that, we have one of the power transformers, T501. So all these squiggles and the vertical lines, that is one device, this whole thing. Connecting to that, we have 5U4, that is a rectifier tube. We have a couple capacitors and a filter choke. Very, very, very common power supply design. We have some windings on this transformer, that's what they call that. When you see this, that means they're windings. The one on the left is going to be the primary, that's going to the, our AC coming out of the wall. A couple vertical lines, that represents the iron core inside of the transformer. Everything on the right are secondary windings. What this does is it takes the incoming voltage, which is around 120 volts, and converts it in some cases lower, some cases higher. For example, the 5U4 needs 5 volts on its filament to work properly. So they'll have a certain number of windings around the iron core such that it will result in 5 volts coming out. And that goes right to the tube filament down there. They have a separate winding insulated from the others. That goes to the plate and the center tap goes to ground. That is going to produce our main B+, plus, the higher B+, plus voltage for the set. So this little circuit right here powers most of the set. After that tube, which is called a full wave rectifier, it's two diodes. It's going to convert the AC coming in to pulse DC. We want clean DC, no ripple, no noise. That's what this stuff does. One electrolytic filter capacitor, a filter choke, and another filter capacitor. I call it a pie filter. Put it on its side, it looks sort of like the pie symbol. Classic design. You'll see it many, many, many times over and over and over in just about everything. Very straightforward, robust, simple. If we look higher up, we have essentially the same thing with the smaller power transformer in a 5Y3. However, we don't see that pie filter. It just goes off to some other stuff. Well, what does it go off to? It goes off to this stuff. Now, to save some money, I imagine, or save some space, rather than having a filter choke for this power supply, they use a field coil speaker meaning there's an electromagnet rather than a permanent magnet on the speaker. And you can also use that electromagnet as a filter choke. So it does two, double duty. It creates a magnet for the speaker to work, and it filters ripple out of the power supply. And here's where we see our electrolytic capacitors as well. And the final thing on that lower chassis is the audio amp. So this guy down here, the RCA plug on top of it, goes to a coupling capacitor. That's one of those paper caps we saw. Goes to a 6SJ7. That's going to be uh, an audio preamp. And then we have a 6Y6 as our driver to drive the speaker. So that's what those, those bumblebee caps, the power resistors we saw, that's for this. Everything else is the power supply. Let's take a look at the main chassis starting with the top side. If you recall from when this was in the cabinet, you have a row of four controls. The one on the far right is the channel selector. The shaft goes directly into a metal box, a sub chassis underneath the main chassis. That's the tuner. It has a wire going into it, going around to the back. It's called twin lead. Goes to two screw terminals. That goes to your antenna. Your receive signal comes in, goes down this cable, goes into this box. This box has an RF amp, radio frequency amplifier, and a down converter to convert this from radio frequencies to a much lower intermediate frequency. There's only a few wires going into this. Hopefully we won't have to mess with it. Hopefully you won't have to ever mess with one. It just needs an input, some power, and produces an output. 
That output goes down two paths. The one in the back is the FM audio. The one in the front is the AM video. Amplitude modulated video has one, two, three, four stages of amplification. Then a detector at the end. The output of this will be composite video. The back side is FM frequency modulated audio, two stages of amplification, interstage transformers, and then a, a ratio detector diode. And then it goes off to the lower chassis for more amplification. Rotating around, we have a few tubes in this area. Those are, well, a final video amplifier stage. Composite video is one volt peak to peak. This needs more like 40 or 50 volts peak to peak to operate properly. So we need some pretty good amplification. We have four stages of IF and then two stages of detected video amplification. Next to that we have a couple tubes. That will be for our synchronization signals, sync separator, sync clipper. Those condition the synchronization signals that are incorporated with the video signal to feed off to the horizontal and vertical circuits. Continuing around, this black box makes the high voltage and drives the horizontal deflection yoke. This is the vertical. Vertical oscillator, vertical amplifier. This drives the vertical yoke that moves electron beam up and down. A couple more tubes here that work for the horizontal. And finally, some more electrolytic caps. The ones on the main chassis are not sufficient for all of our needs on this chassis. Of course, we have the picture tube on top. High voltage comes in. We have a conductive coating on the outside. It's grounded. There's also a conductive coating on the inside going to the high voltage. Glass in between that forms a capacitor that helps filter the high voltage. Yoke. Electromagnetic focus to concentrate the electron beam to a small point on the screen. Ion trap magnet helps prevent the screen from getting burned by stray molecules of air that are inevitably going to still be inside the CRT. And of course we have signals going to the back for the filament and the video signal and the uh, intensity modulation. Uh, so let's take a look underneath now. Here's a look underneath. Obviously a lot more going on. For one, I made it sound simple. We pick off some sync signals and we have oscillators and everything gets synchronized and we get a perfect picture, right? Except we're dealing in the tube era. The voltage is not regulated on these sets. If the line voltage going into the set varies, the stuff coming out of the wall, which probably varied more then than now, all the voltages in your set vary. As the voltages in your set vary, it can shift the frequency of the oscillators. It can shift the gain of amplifiers. So we have controls to compensate for that. Also, as the set warms up or as the ambient temperature changes winter versus summer, the component values change, which again will cause the oscillators to drift, which will cause the gains to change. So we have all these controls on front to compensate for that. Horizontal hold, vertical hold, brightness, contrast, fine tuning. Obviously, we have a lot more going on down here. For each of those amplification stages, we need to set the bias, we need to couple the signal, we need to filter any noise out that may be getting picked up from the environment. That's what most of these parts are for. Some oddities. Or I'll, well, let me go through and identify some things. The one oddity is this thing. They needed a little bit of negative voltage. So we've got our big old power transformers that make several hundred volts, power all the tubes. But some of the tube circuits, you need a little bit of negative bias on the grid to get the right operating range. Where are you going to do, where are you going to get that? You could add yet another rectifier tube, perhaps another transformer or another secondary winding and filter caps and all that on the main power supply. 
or do what they did here, which is they take the filament voltage, all these tubes run on 6.3 volts, they rectify with a little baby selenium rectifier and filter it with a couple caps. They only need something like negative 8 volts at very low current. So they chose to do it with this little circuit tacked on down here. You may be familiar with old radios that sometimes had a uh, bias cell in them, which was a battery that would provide the negative bias. Typically the bias current is extremely small microamps, so a battery can last decades. Similar with this, this current draw is so low, they don't want to waste a tube or a transformer and all that. We just need a little bit of current, a little bit of negative voltage, so let's do it with this. This big old guy here with the D on it, that's our vertical output transformer. The vertical runs at a much lower frequency than the horizontal. We have to couple it from the vertical output amp, which is high impedance, to a very, very low impedance yoke winding, which is some coils of wire, creates a magnetic field, moves the electron beam around. That's what this does. It goes from high impedance to low impedance. So we have our IF down here, so we have a lot of components to set the bias, the gain, the uh, automatic gain control. Or sorry, I'm pointing the wrong area. That's up here. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the sweep circuit down here. I should have realized that. I'll tell you a way to tell the circuits apart. The IF is high frequency, 22 megahertz in this particular case. Notice something. What's not up there? What don't you see? Get down even lower for you. It's a noticeable difference in what types of components you see. Here's our tuner. Here's our IF. There are no paper caps up there. Much, much higher frequency. It's all done with ceramic and mica caps. Sweep frequencies. 30 hertz, 60 hertz, 16 kilohertz. Much lower frequency. We have a whole bunch of big old paper caps down there. Same with our sync circuits. Same with our final video. The video is going to be 0 to 4 megahertz or so. The audio is going to be 0 to 20 kilohertz or so. And the sweep circuits, 30 hertz and about 16 kilohertz. The IF, 22 megahertz. All the components are much smaller and different types of material. Probably won't need to do anything to this, and I suggest you don't, unless you know there's a problem. Work on this stuff first. These parts, as they age, as they get leaky and whatnot, the bigger the component is, typically the more likely you are to have trouble. Like this is, I think, the largest value paper cap in the set. Because there's so much more surface area, there's so much more deterior material to deteriorate. So the larger the component, typically, the, the more failure points it has, and the more likely it is to have failed. So when I start working on these, I typically go after this stuff first. I, or I start out with the power supply, which has the biggest parts of all. And then I go for the sweep circuits. The last thing I would think about doing is the RF or the IF stuff, this stuff up here. So that's what we're going to do when we work on this set. We're going to start with the power supply, then do the sweep circuits, do the audio circuit, do the AGC, do the sync circuits, and save this for last if we need to do anything to it. Finally, a few controls on the back. Those are controls you're far less likely to need to use. Those set operating point on a horizontal output tube, horizontal frequency, linearity, stuff like that. Things the user wouldn't normally do. He'd bring in a service tacker to adjust those if needed. Now, looking for trouble spots down here. What would I be looking for? Well, if a paper cap fails catastrophically, you might see an end of one of these caps blown out, the wax plug blown out, and some paper and foil extruded around the set. These are electrolytic caps, 50 microfarad, 25 volts. If these fail, just like more modern stuff, you'd see crust. You'd see stuff having oozed out, and some crustiness formed, an end might pop out on one of these as well. 
if the selenium rectifier had failed, it would probably look charred around here. In general, we want to look for any charred wiring. If somebody's worked on it, maybe wires that are clipped off. Now, there's one thing that jumped out to me right away, uh, or didn't, I should say, the first time I looked at it, but later when I looked at it, it did. You may have seen it, too. What the heck is this thing? It's far more modern. These are carbon film resistors. These could have been made 20 years ago. Uh, I know what this is. I think I know what this is. We have a bunch of tiny ceramic caps on the other side. Let's take a look at the schematic. This, if you recall from the top side, this is a vertical circuit. A vertical oscillator, vertical lamp. I think I know what that is. Let's go through the whole schematic and then I'll get to show what that component is when we get to it. Starting in the upper left hand corner, this box, that's our tuner. Remember I mentioned it was pretty well self-contained? They just show ABC, three signals going into or coming out of it. A is our audio, B is our video, and C is our AGC, automatic gain control. All right, A goes to audio. As I mentioned, two stages, two 6AU6s. First audio IF, second audio IF. They take the output of the tuner, they amplify it. Goes through a little transformer attached to a 6AL5 dual diode that converts it from frequency modulated to audio. And then it goes off to the audio amp on a lower chassis. Below that is our video amp. And I was wrong, there are four stages of video IF, which was really nice for the era. Either 6AU6s or in some cases a couple 6AG5s, depending on the revision. After that, just like with the FM, although in a different configuration, we have another 6AL5 that converts the AM to composite video. And also a little something called DC restoration we'll get to later. And then a 6AU6 again, and then a 6K6 for the final video amp. Now, bottom left, we get into our sync circuits. And notice this thing on the left is encased in dashed lines. What does that mean? Well, if you've ever watched one of my predictive videos, you've heard me mention couplates. That's what that is. That's what that was. There are other names for them, but that's the name I often see used. C-O-U-P-L-A-T-E. What is that? It is uh, an early form of hybrid thick film technology, uh, ceramic substrate, and they deposited layers of conductive and insulating material to create capacitors and resistors and one encased package has had three leads coming out of it. It's called a vertical integrator. It's what turns pulses in the received signal into something that the vertical oscillator can lock onto. It must have failed and rather than getting a, a replacement for it, a uh, new couplet, they built one out of individual discrete components, which is perfectly valid, and I've seen this, you're going to see the circuit in every single vintage TV, and often they do use discrete, by discrete I mean individual resistors and capacitors, with these values as shown on a terminal strip rather than a little module. If you hunted around on eBay or something, you might find one, but we're going to end up making that circuit ourselves, just like they did. That goes on the vertical oscillator, which then goes through a vertical output under 6K6, and that drives the vertical yoke, as I mentioned. They have this laid out kind of oddly, the sink, amp, and separator they show in the middle. It takes a video signal, and then it, part of it goes off to the left, part of it goes off to the right. So part of it goes off to that integrator on the left for the vertical, and part of it goes off to the right to provide a sink pulse to the horizontal oscillator. And that uses a sync discriminator and a synchro guide circuit. That's what this coil is all about to lock onto that sync signal, which goes to a 6V6. Kind of, you may be familiar with these for audio applications, but you do see audio tube 6SN7, 6V6s in TVs, which is a little unfortunate for the hobbyist because the prices have been inflated by. Audio enthusiasts, so you just have to deal with that. And 
eventually that goes to our 6BG6, which is a big old tube inside of that metal box. And that drives this flyback, which is this guy. And we have some tubes in there to help create the high voltage and drive the horizontal yoke. And finally, a little circuit down here. To do focus on this early type of CRT, you need a magnetic field around the neck with a focus coil. That's what this is, and you want to adjust that to get the best focus. So there's a big rheostat or potentiometer on the front of the set to vary that magnetic field. That's it. Let's uh, take a look inside that metal box. I'll show you the high voltage stuff. Other than that, I, I don't see any cause for concern underneath the chassis. Yeah, somebody did do a little bit of work. They rebuilt the sink separator. Of, of all, or vertical integrator. Of all the things to fail on a TV, to have only the vertical integrator fail and nothing else seems extraordinarily unlikely to me. I'm not saying it's impo nothing's impossible. But boy, that's weird. I've never seen anybody... I mean, clearly somebody put some work and put some effort in, and identified that as a failed part and fabricated a new one, but they didn't do anything else to the set. Weird. My thought is that it had a vertical rolling problem and they just fixed that and nothing else. Or they didn't finish and they just started. And they just started with that for some reason. Which also makes it more likely that the set was kind of working. And rather than just blow through and recap it, he identified the worst problem and tackled that first. A weird mix of fasteners here. There's a sheet metal screw in there and the rest are like this. This is what would have been originally a very, very common fastener to see in these such sheet metal screws with a quarter inch hex head. I mentioned the power cord. Typically on these sets it goes to what they call an AC interlock. The idea being that either when you take this back off the set or you take this off, it removes the power cord. So you can't plug it in and operate it with this cover being off. Unless you have something called a cheater cord, which of course I do. Well, this can be pretty stubborn. There's a bunch of screws here which I've taken off and then it slides into this. So we're gonna use a little bit of leverage here on the back side. See if we can bring it up a little bit. Oh, I missed the screw. Jeez, <laughs> we have a flat head, we have a Phillips head, and we have some X heads. <laughs> Obviously a sign that somebody's been in here before. Lost some of the screws and just threw whatever they could find in here. It baffles me how this stuff happens. And it's coming. There we go. Okay, and there is a hole in the back, uh, so you can get to something called the width control, another fine adjustment. All right, so here's what we have inside. That is the flyback transformer that makes the high voltage, sort of like a mini Tesla coil. We have our three tubes in there. That is our 5V4 damper tube, and our 6BG6 horizontal tube. This is what drives this guy, big old power tube. That's our high voltage rectifier. This, this is a problem. I don't think I've ever seen a good one of these in any of these sets. That is a huge power resistor. I think it's rated for 25 watts, but these days something that size would be 50 or 100 watts. They're almost always bad. It's a ceramic tube with resistance wire wrapped around it and it's dipped in porcelain and fired or something like that. They fail because air gets in there and they corrode or something goes wrong with the set and it burns the wire open inside. Kind of a pain to replace. And notice it has taps. Part of the service info, our setup info, is to pick the tap that gives you the best horizontal linearity, this uh, term they use. If we need to, I've 
come up with some substitutes, and it's kind of an oddball value too. I think it's 7.5k or 6.5k or something like that. Or it's 5300 with two taps at 500, so it'd be 6300 ohms from one end to the other. You can't buy that. You can get a 7500, you can get a 10k, and then I put a resistor in parallel to get the right. Anyways, we'll, we'll deal with that if we have to, and very likely we have to. I mention it now because. I'm going to leave off here, and the next installment, we're going to try powering this up, because I didn't see anything that scared me, or worried me. But before we do, we're going to measure this, and if this is open, I'm going to substitute something for it immediately, because with this being... Well, I shouldn't say that. The set will power it. Regardless of whether this is open or not, we'll, we'll power it up as is. But this is one of the first things we're going to replace, if it is open. Alright, that's going to be it for now. I went fast because I had a lot of stuff to cover. I'm trying to keep these videos somewhat manageable. If you didn't follow all that, as we work on each of these sections, I will go over them in more detail. I wanted to give you a quick overview of everything. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.